Welcome to a casual philosophy belated New Year special. In this video, I'll be covering the top 10 philosophy papers of 2020. The plan is to give a brief summary and some thoughts on each one. But before we start, if you're a philosophically minded person, you've probably already wondered what I mean by top philosophy papers. Don't worry, I will be explaining my selection process near the end of the video. Also, if you're curious about a specific paper, see the description below for timestamps and links to the articles online. So without further ado, let's jump right in with number 10. Justice Without Retribution, an epistemic argument against retributive criminal punishment by Greg Caruso, appearing in Neuroethics, Volume 13, Issue 1, April 2020. This paper is about justifications for how and why we punish people when they do something wrong, specifically in legal settings. And the argument is against retributive justice, or the idea that people who do something wrong just deserve to have some harm inflicted on them, independent of any downstream effects like satisfaction for victims or deterrence. First, Caruso argues that we have good reasons to think that people aren't responsible for their actions in the way that retribution requires. And second, if you think people are so responsible, the burden of proof is on you to establish that, since you're the one advocating something that will justify people being harmed on a very large scale. So this argument relies on the principle that if you're advocating something with the risk of widespread harm, then you should be really, really sure that you're right, and the standards of proof and evidence go up. Caruso offers an alternative justification for punishment, what he calls a public health quarantine model, where we see criminal behavior kind of like a disease. So we should, for example, prioritize prevention and taking actions based primarily on a concern for safety. As for my own thoughts on this, I really like the paper. The topic of punishment is just perfect philosophical terrain because it links deep metaphysical issues with rubber hits the road policy and legal implications. And it draws on a whole lot of philosophical issues and topics along the way, like free will, justice, well-being, uh, the good life, and how we deal with evidence, and so on. Also, since this was in a special issue of neuroethics, I get the feeling that Caruso was writing more for a general audience, so it was quite accessible as well. Number 9. What is Epistemic Blame? by Jessica Brown. This paper was first published in 2018, but it appeared in Noose 54 in 2020. The topic of this paper is the blame that we direct at people for things that they ought to believe or maybe ought not to believe. Brown wants to investigate the nature of this blame, what justifies it, how it might be like or unlike moral blame, and so on. Note that the topic is not specifically blameworthiness, or what makes someone the right object of blame, but blame itself. In other words, what's going on with the person who is doing the blaming, why they have the set of attitudes and dispositions that they do. Brown's explanation is quite simple. Epistemic blame is based on desire a desire that the object of blame did not act or believe as they did. My thoughts on this paper? I think this paper was quite accessible, and the topic is very interesting, but you'd definitely benefit from knowing what terms like externalism or reliabilism refer to in philosophy. There are also some interesting side questions, like whether or not we have a general desire to have true beliefs, or whether both moral and epistemic blame fall under a wider and more general notion of blame. Next up, and continuing with epistemology, we have Belief, Credence, and Evidence by Elizabeth Jackson. This appeared in Synthes 197 of last year. This one has a nice direct title because it is actually about beliefs and credences and how they respond differently to evidence. Basically, beliefs are mental states that say something like X is true while a credence is more like X is probably true, or I'm 45% sure that X. Jackson covers some examples where evidence seems to affect these two things differently, like where the evidence can increase our certainty in something to very high levels, but nonetheless it doesn't seem rational to believe that thing. Her explanation for this is that when evidence itself highlights the possibility of error, then the evidence justifies higher credence but not belief. This implies that belief is the result of shutting out the possibility of being wrong from our awareness. So maybe ideal knowers would not believe anything, and they would just have credences. This argument also implies that how evidence is presented is relevant to whether we should form beliefs or update our credences, which is a bit counterintuitive, but quite interesting as well. 
Number seven is Perceptual Pluralism by Jake Quality Dunn, also appearing in Noose 54. This was a difficult paper, so my recap probably won't be very good, but here goes. So we have things in our minds that stand in for things in the world. These are representations. Representations could be image-like, like pictorial symbols or icons, or they could be language-like, like sentences or words. Things that are like sentences, their parts can be separated and reconstituted and still keep their meaning, while images have their meaning in a more holistic way. So the question is, what are perceptual representations like? The bulk of this paper is the author looking at a bunch of experimental evidence covering how people think about things that they see, and he concludes that perceptual representations have both language-like features and image-like features. The author also suggests that we might need to go deeper to find the distinction between perceptual and cognitive thought, way down into the architecture of the mind or brain itself. In sum, this paper was very dense, with a feeling like a literature review. So I think if you really dove into it and looked into some of the experiments and really understood them, you'd gain a pretty good understanding of this field. To be honest, the difficulty of this paper for me meant that I didn't understand most of it. But if this is your sort of subject, then you could have a better time. But we're getting back on the epistemology train with number six, the rational impermissibility of accepting some racial generalizations by Rene Bollinger in Synthes 197. So this paper addresses the question of whether we should believe things based on racial stereotypes, even if those stereotypes actually support the belief in question. The author mentions that others have given moral and practical reasons against forming such beliefs, but she thinks we have epistemic reasons, that is, reasons having to do with good belief and knowledge-forming practices. So to do this, she introduces the concept of acceptance, which is treating something as true enough to base your actions on it. As such, it's an epistemic concept that incorporates practical concerns and outcomes and so on. Whether you are justified in accepting something depends on the risks of being wrong, and given the risk of acting on racial stereotypes, a higher justification is required. Not only are there risks in being wrong in a given instance, but there are long-term costs of using that kind of evidence beyond the present situation, and those need to be taken into account as well. This is a great paper and an interesting read. I also wonder, though, if the author has fudged the epistemic and moral divide somewhat by simply building the moral into their epistemic concept of acceptance. This paper also seems to form a natural pair with the previous paper, Beliefs, Credences, and Evidence. Now down to the final five, we have Encrasia or Evidentialism, Learning to Love Mismatch by Maria Lassonen Arneo. This appeared in Philosophical Studies 177. This paper sets out a paradox where it seems that someone is justified in according their belief to the evidence but the result is some irrationally incoherent set of beliefs. Unfortunately, the author doesn't give a concrete example of the kind of evidence they have in mind, and I was unable to think of one myself. As a result, this paper was hard for me to follow. So I can't say much about the paradox itself, however, the author solves the problem by proposing that we do away with the idea that rationality requires coherent beliefs. Instead, as she argues, Rational beliefs are those which proceed from good epistemic practices. There's more to this regarding what counts as good belief-forming processes, which again was a little hard for me to grasp, and I'd zoned out a little bit by that point. But in short, this was a really dense paper with a lot of details and caveats and distinctions that would seem esoteric and not make much sense to the casual reader, so enter at your own risk. At the other end of the accessibility spectrum is number four, A Case for Removing Confederate Monuments by Travis Timmerman. This was published as a book chapter in Ethics Left and Right, The Moral Issues That Divide Us. This was a refreshing and quite fun paper to read. It was short, punchy, and very clear. The question addressed was, do we have a moral obligation to remove statues of Confederate generals? So very timely as well. The conclusion was, yes we do, because they inflict harm on undeserving people and there are no reasons to keep them that are strong enough to outweigh that harm. 
The author considers a number of objections and deals with them in short order. For example, someone might say that these statues have some historic value. Answers given by the author include that they don't because many are cheaply made and put up recently for racist reasons. Uh, also, they can be easily replaced with things that provide that value in a better and less harmful way. And finally, none of their supposed value uh, would outweigh their actual harms. An interesting clarification that the author offers is that we have reason to remove these statues only insofar as they do in fact cause harm. So there's actually no threat that consistency would demand we remove statues of, say, Gandhi or George Washington as well. There are some tensions in the argument that could be explored in a longer paper, but given the length, I think this paper is great and I would recommend reading it. At number three, we have Ideological Diversity, Hostility, and Discrimination in Philosophy. This article is by Uwe Peters, Nathan Honeycutt, Andreas de Bloch, and Lee Yusson. I think I pronounced those right. This paper covers a psychology survey of the ideological leanings of philosophers. I was a little reluctant to include this one, but it's in the Journal of Philosophical Psychology. One of the authors is a philosopher, and it actually includes some argument that I would say is philosophical. Anyway, some of the findings were as follows. First, the discipline of philosophy is overwhelmingly left-leaning, around 75% of philosophers to be specific. And although a minority of philosophers across the spectrum were willing to discriminate against others based on ideology, more left-leaning philosophers were more often willing to discriminate and were more likely to think that discrimination was justified. There was also some intra-ideology hostility and discrimination reported among left-leaning philosophers, but not among right-leaning ones. The interesting and, I think, philosophical part of this paper is why we might think that this state of affairs is bad. Two reasons are offered. First, it's against the express ethical commitments of many philosophical institutions and philosophers, which is to promote inclusiveness and open inquiry. Second, this situation is likely to lead to worse academic outcomes. There are risks of forming an echo chamber defined by confirmation bias and fewer opportunities for constructive conflict. These risks are especially great given how philosophy works, because so much of philosophy, uh, especially about politics and ethics, is done by reliance on ethical and political beliefs and intuitions. Number two is Gender and Gender Terms by Elizabeth Barnes. This one also appeared in News 54. The topic of this paper is the metaphysics of gender, and as the author points out, this is typically thought of as looking for the true meaning of terms like man or woman and so on. This, as she argues, is a mistake, and we shouldn't actually expect our best metaphysical explanation of gender to map neatly onto our natural language terms. The author then discusses two main approaches to the metaphysics of gender, the social position and identity-based theories. Social position-based theories explain gender in terms of stuff outside the person, like culture, expectations, norms, how others perceive you, and so on. Identity-based theories explain gender in terms of how you see yourself, or in terms of some other kind of internal access. However, as the author notes, both approaches suffer from exclusion problems. That is, they can't be extended to all the individuals or groups that we might want. As she goes on to argue, social role theory gives us the best accounts of how gender works and its structure in the world, but it's not a theory about how to use gender terms like man or woman. The meaning of those words are in part defined by use, social understanding, context, and so on. In short, there is no single correct meaning of those terms, although there are many incorrect ones. As you might guess, there is some stuff here that might be controversial, like the idea that the variety of gender identities is due to varying relationships to the gender binary, as it exists in society. Also, that terms like man and woman maybe have a variety of valid possible meanings, and some of these might exclude trans men and trans women, respectively. In sum, this paper is both well-written and fascinating, both clarifying for a lot of confusing issues and confusing in a good way, and it offers a simple and promising solution to a host of problems. And finally, at number one, we have Echo Chambers and Epistemic Bubbles by Chris T. Nguyen, 
appearing in Episteme 17. This paper describes epistemic bubbles and echo chambers, what makes them different, and why echo chambers are particularly challenging both to dismantle and escape from. In short, epistemic bubbles are formed when people exclude sources of information more or less by accident. Echo chambers are formed by actively discrediting sources of information that conflict with the aims or beliefs of the group. Focusing on echo chambers, the author discusses some features and techniques that create and perpetuate them, including the use of conspiracy theories to explain and debunk contrary sources of information. Unlike epistemic bubbles, echo chambers are robust, resilient, and self-reinforcing. As the author argues, we all rely on networks of trust and background beliefs to assess new sources of evidence. Echo chambers are perversions of these sorts of systems, existing in parallel with them, with different starting conditions that force otherwise good epistemic agents towards bad ends. So simply giving information or evidence to someone within an echo chamber can actually have no effect or even backfire. The implication of all this is that it is both hard to recognize if you are in an echo chamber, and it's hard to find a way out. How then to escape an echo chamber? The author seems to recommend two courses of action here. From within an echo chamber, you could try a complete reboot of big chunks of your belief system and belief forming processes, acting as a, quote, cognitive newborn, giving everything a tentative and fragile trust. But all of this seems unlikely, because where would someone inside an echo chamber find the motivation to undertake such a daunting task? The alternative is to be brought out of an echo chamber by another person, and here the author stresses relationships of personal trust being built up between people inside and outside the echo chamber. It is this which allows testimony of people outside the echo chamber to penetrate the grip of the echo chamber and hopefully pull someone out of it. I definitely recommend that you go to Phil Papers and download this one and read it. What are my thoughts on this list? Well, first, I was quite interested to see how many of the papers were in the field of social epistemology, specifically looking at the relationship between belief and responsibility. Next, I was also quite pleased to see that despite recent controversies, gender is still quite an active topic in philosophy. This is good, I think, especially because of how much outside interest there is. To illustrate, papers on the topic of gender were some of the most downloaded in 2020, including titles like Are Women Adult Human Females by Alex Byrne, Escaping the Natural Attitude About Gender by Robin Dembroff, Evaluating Arguments for the Sex-Gender Distinction by Thomas Bogardus, Some Internal Problems with Revisionary Gender Concepts, again by Thomas Bogardus, and Beyond Binary, Gender Queer as a Critical Gender Kind, also again by Robin Dembroff. So by now you're probably wondering how on earth I compiled this list, and I will discuss that next. Okay, how did I compile this top 10? To begin with, definitely not by reading a whole bunch of papers and then deciding which 10 were the best. Instead, the process was quite simple. I just went to philpapers.org, searched 2020, and then sorted by impact and downloads, and made a list of the top 15 or so for each. I then removed anything that wasn't a paper or article in the traditional sense, for example, some of the top downloads that were open access books. Papers with the highest impact formed the core of the list. I think Phil Papers measures impact by some combination of citations and downloads, although I'm not sure. And then I made some discretionary additions to the list, uh, drawing from the most downloaded papers list. The list of top downloads uh, was obviously drawn from a skewed sample, but I think some of those were important to include for reasons I won't get into. Long story short, are these really the top papers by some rigorous or objective standard? No, they aren't. Are they the best papers? Maybe, uh, although someone could have written a brilliant work of pure genius that due to the topic and the field that they're in just wouldn't get a lot of citations or downloads and then wouldn't appear on this list. So there you have it, the top 10 philosophy papers of 2020. Let me know what you think about the list, anything that stood out as interesting, absurd, or just plain wrong. Also, if you want to get more content like this in the future, then like the video or subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.